We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. And I just start off by saying something. Uh, I didn't have this written down. I didn't plan to say this, but um, man, I just sincerely from the bottom of my heart, I love you. Um, I know that sounds weird. Some of you are like, this is my first time here. We don't even know each other. Uh, but man, I, I love being a part of this church and um, knowing that God's allowed us to, to gather together on mornings and to worship him corporately and throughout the week. It's just such a privilege to be a pastor here. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, um, I love you too. Uh, my name is Matt. I serve here as a lead pastor at ACC. And one of the best parts of my job is I get to open up God's word and help us understand it more. Most Sundays, probably about 65% of the time, uh, this is one of, one of my jobs. So uh, today, like Pastor Mike was saying, we're in the fifth part of five weeks as we've been talking about the origins of all things. You know, where do we come from and where did sin come from and why are there so many people that look differently and talk differently than me throughout this world? And we've had opportunities to have that conversation. Today, we're going to wrap up the series and look at, as we go into the latter part of Genesis, at the life of Abraham. The life of Abraham. And so Abraham, you're going to read some passages today where you're going to hear about some guy named Abram. And some woman named Sarai. And I just want you to know that Abram and Sarai are Abraham and Sarah before their names were changed by God. So when you hear about Abram today and you hear about Sarai, we're talking about Abraham and his wife, Sarah. And so we're going to talk a little bit about their life and some promises that God made to them and how you and I can be involved in those promises. So let's open up a copy of God's Word. If you've got one with you today, I hope you do. Uh, to Genesis chapter 12. All right, Genesis chapter 12. If you're in this room right now and you don't own a copy of the Bible, uh, just grab the one underneath the chair in front of you, write your name in it, take it home with you. Uh, everyone in this room has a Bible as of this moment, all right? So we all have a Bible. Genesis, the first book of the Bible, uh, chapter 12. And this is where God makes a really powerful promise to Abraham. Here's the promise that he makes. He says, the Lord has said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the families on earth will be blessed through you. Real quick little sneak peek. Why should we as Christians today pray for Israel? Well, you read a verse like this. It says, Abraham, I'm going to pray or I'm going to bless those who bless you. And I'm going to curse those who curse you. Uh, so that there's, there's one reason right there. But if you read that one those three verses, Genesis chapter 12, right? It says, God makes a promise to this guy named Abram, who will later become Abraham. And he promises him some pretty big things, right? Some really powerful things. And if you think about uh, the song that all of us know, probably in this room about Abraham. You guys remember this song, maybe from when you were kids, right? In fact, if I start singing it, I bet you'll sing it with me. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham, I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord, right? And then we start moving our bodies around, and this is something we would have done in Sunday. Well, here, here's the thing about this promise. The promise says really a couple things. One thing it says is that, Abraham, you are going to be the father of, of many nations, that you're going to be, have many sons. And the, the song actually sings about that, right? Father Abraham had many sons. Another thing that God promises in this promise is that your name will be famous. I can start singing a song about Abraham, and most of you in this room know the song. Why? Because Abraham's name has been made famous. Most people 
uh, in, in the United States would probably have heard of the name of Abraham, a famous name. But there's another part of the song that confuses me a little bit, right? It says, uh, I am one of them, and so are you. I don't know about you, but I look back at my family tree. I've traced it back as far as I can in most directions. And I have a hard time tracing my family lineage into the Jewish lineage. As far as I know, I'm 100% Gentile. I don't know about you. I'm sure there's some of you that have Jewish heritage in you. Uh, but for the most part, most of us are probably Gentiles. And so when we sing a song about Father Abraham have many, having many sons, and then we say, I am one of them, and so are you, that's a bit odd, because I'm like, how am I a son of Abraham? I come from one of those other non-Abrahamic lines, probably, and so I, I don't quite get it. But you see, packed into the bottom of this promise, remember he says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who treat you with contempt. And then it says this, all of the families on earth will be blessed through you. How are all the families of the earth blessed through Abraham? How are you blessed through the family of Abraham? You see, when you trace Abraham's family line uh, in, in the forward direction, not the backwards direction, you're going to find that the, one of the descendants of Abraham is by the name of Jesus Christ. So if you're in this room right now and you've put your faith in Christ, you've put your faith in him, believe it or not, you're one of the families on the earth that has been blessed through Abraham's promise. How cool is that? In Galatians 3, 29, it, it makes this really bold claim. It says, and now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Do you know who Paul is writing to when he writes this letter to the church, the New Testament church in Galatia? He's basically writing to a Gentile audience. And he says, guess what, you people who are not part of the family line of Abraham, through putting your faith in Jesus, you are now part of Abraham's family. You are now part of that promise. You can now sing, I am one of them, and so are you. If you're in this room, don't miss this, and you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a son and daughter of Abraham, according to Galatians 3.29. You've been part of that promise that all the nations of the earth will be blessed because of Abraham. You see, God's promise to Abraham belongs to you too, believer. So here's what we're going to do this morning. I've written down six ways that you can claim the promises that were made to Abraham. If you want to know, how do I claim the promises that were made to Abraham? If you want to, uh, I turned in my, my sermon notes a little late this week, so they didn't get the fill in the blanks on your notes for you. But you can make a one through six, all right? Six ways to claim the promises made to Abraham. Here's the first one. If you want to claim the promise made to Abraham, you have to accept Jesus Christ as Lord. It's real simple. If you don't have Jesus Christ, according to Galatians 3.29, it's, it's through faith in Jesus that you become part of Abraham's family. It's through faith in Jesus that you become part of God's family. If you don't have faith in him, then you're outside of this promise. So if you want to claim some of these promises, then you're going to give your life to Jesus Christ. This is key. In fact, you can now, if you're a follower of Jesus... You can read this promise to Abraham differently. Really what God was saying to Abraham is, Abraham, one day Matt Osdall will be blessed because of his faith in Jesus who's going to come from your family line. One day all the people of Arundel Christian Church who have placed their faith in one of your descendants, Abraham, are going to be blessed. It's pretty cool. You have to put your faith in Jesus, though. You know, Paul liked to write about this subject. He liked to tie uh, the concept of a New Testament church to the promises to Abraham. And we read a lot about this in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 is pretty much all about Abraham. And here's what Paul says in the New Testament. In verse 22, he says, And when God counted Abraham as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too. Hey, New Testament church, this promise to Abraham was recorded for your benefit as well. 
It says, assuring to us that God will also count us as righteous if what? If, say it again, if what? If we believe in him, then we get to be part of these promises that God made to Abraham. The one who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. If you go actually back a little bit up into Romans 4, verses 1 through 5, here's what it says about Abraham. Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that's not, but that was not God's way. For the scriptures tell us Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. If you're in this room right now, I want you to know that if you're part of Abraham's family, if you're part of God's family and you've been counted as righteous, it's not because of anything you did. You are far from righteous. I am far from righteous. But it does say that one day God's going to count uh, some people as righteous and some people as unrighteous. And he's going to put me and hopefully you in the category of righteous. Why? Not because of anything I did or anything you did but simply because we've placed our faith in Jesus the way Abraham did. How cool is that? In order to claim these promises that were made to Abraham, you have to first accept Jesus Christ as Lord. There's no other way around it. Here's the second thing. If you want to claim the promises made to Abraham, number two, you have to do hard things when asked. This one's really tough for many of us. You have to do hard things when asked. I want you to think about this for a moment. Abraham in in verses 1 through 3 was asked to pick up all of his stuff and to to take his, his family and his stuff and to move somewhere else. He had lived for 75 years in this land. He knows the people there. He knows the culture there. His relatives are there. His, his, his parents are probably buried and his grandparents are buried there. Everything that he knows is there. And God goes up to him and says, Abraham, uh, Abram, I want you to, to take everything that's yours and I want you to get up and, and get this. He doesn't even tell him where he's going. He says, I want you to get up and I want you to go to a land I will tell you about later. Isn't that crazy? Talk about being asked to do something hard. The closest I can come up with in my own life is I remember when I was 34 years old. So this is about uh, nine years ago. God asked my family to, to do something similar. He said, Matt, I want you to pick up I want you to pull up roots. Uh, I know that you've been in Delaware for this amount of time and all your family's here. The church that you love is here. The Sunday school class and the small group you're a part of is here. Your, your in-laws live like across the street. And every, all your extended family is like right here. And we want you to get up and go somewhere else away from all that. I remember like pushing back. I remember being scared. I remember not being super excited about this. I remember walking into a a room full of people in our church where all of our family and friends basically gathered on a weekly basis. And I remember breaking down in tears as I told them, we have to leave. I didn't want to go. And, And what's even crazier, if you really think about Abraham, um, He didn't even ask questions. I'll I'll get to that in a minute, but I, um, there was a song written by Vertical Worship that was really meaningful to me during this season of transition in my life. And the song is called Frontiers. If you think about what is a frontier, right? A frontier is a, is a, a land 
where there's a, a line at which you've never gone past it. It's, it's something new. It's something scary. It's something undiscovered, uncharted, unmapped, right? The great frontier is outside of your current knowledge comfort base, right? It's outside of your comfort zone. It's outside of what, anything you've ever experienced before. That's why we call it the frontier. And this song, one of the lyrics in it says this, Take me, it's a prayer to God, take me to the end of myself. Take me to the edge of something greater. And we all get to this point where we're standing at a line where we recognize I've never been beyond this point. Like behind this line, I'm still in my level of comfort. I'm in a, around people I know. I'm around things I understand. This all feels good for me, but everything out there well, that's scary. That's unknown. I have no idea what's out there. And we get to a place where we want to claim the promises that were made to Abraham. We have to be willing to do hard things when asked. When God says, listen, Matt, I want you to get all the way up to the edge of yourself. I want you to get up to the line where you've never been before. And then I want you to trust me when I ask you to march forward into the unknown. That's exactly what Abraham does. It's exactly where he finds himself. God says, pick up everything and go to a land I am going to show you. Now, like I said, wouldn't you ask some questions? Here's what I would have done. If this story were about me and you're reading my story, you would have heard, and then Abraham said, God, let me pray about this. <laughs> or you would have maybe heard, listen, could you at least tell me where we're going so I can do like a cost of living analysis. Can you give me some sort of a, 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 let me just go talk to some people I know and trust. I need some wisdom here. But here's what, it, here's what Abraham does, right? In verse four, it says, so Abram departed as the Lord had instructed. Now, certainly maybe we're getting the short version of the story. Maybe he asked a ton of questions. But that's not included in the Bible account. God says, go. And it says, Abraham got up and he went. It says, he, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran. Man, I had only lived in Delaware for 10 years and I was scared to leave. He was in this place for 75 years, his whole life. And God says, Abraham, I want you to do something really hard. I want you to trust me. And he does. So if we want to be part of claiming this promise, one of the things we can learn from him is we need to be willing to do hard things when asked. Let's keep, keep reading. It says he took his family and his wealth and his stuff and he went as God told him. And then they arrive in a new land and God makes this, this uh, another part of this promise. In Genesis 12, verse 7, it says, Then the Lord appeared to Abram, and said, I will give this land to your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. Notice what he says here and what he doesn't say. He says, Abram, I'm going to give this land to you. He doesn't quite say that, does he? He says, Abram, I'm going to give this land to your descendants. It's not quite ready for you to claim yet. It's not quite ready and, and ripe for the picking yet. But there's something here that I want you to know. I made a promise and this land is going to be your descendants land. And so the third thing I want us to write down, how to claim the promises made to Abraham, is you got to learn to, ready, be patient. How many of you struggle with patience like I do? Like, God, you made a promise to me. You told me, let's do this. I want it now. Remember Veruca Salt from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, <laughs> right? She finds out about this thing called a golden egg, and she says, what? I want it now. How many of us do that in our life? Like we hear about God's promise for us. We know that God wants to be a blessing to us. We know that God has a good plan for our lives. And we're like, God, I want that, and I want it now. But we see an example here where God had made an incredible promise to Abram. And he's telling him, Abram, one day, not, not here, not now, 
but one day I'm going to give this land to you and your descendants. Sometimes we have to be patient because you know this, a good father knows not only how to give good gifts, but he knows when you're ready to receive them. Can you imagine giving your child a gift that they're not quite ready to receive? Imagine like giving like a, a, a welding kit to your two-year-old. Like, wait, what? Like not quite ready to understand how this works, you know. A good father knows not only how to give good gifts, but when to give them. For me, I, I was called into ministry when I was a sophomore in high school. And so it would have been easy, you know, the moment I graduated high school to say, God, I want that now. I want, I want what I'm excited about. I was excited about it the whole time. I was excited about going into ministry. And uh, it wasn't high school. Right out of high school, I was supposed to do it. So God sent me to college. And I went to college and studied youth ministry. And I did that. And I was excited. I could have left right out of, youth, you know, college. And my wife was getting her master's degree at Longwood University. And if, it's in a little town called Farmville. The, the largest church in Farmville had a part-time lead pastor, let alone a paid youth pastor. So I'm like, all right, God's saying, not now, not now. And then God led us in some other places. And it wasn't until 19 years later that God told us, now's the time. Pick up your stuff and go. That was hard. Sometimes God asks you to wait patiently so that Genesis chapter 12, forgive me today, I'm going to be skipping past some parts. I want you to go back in your copy of God's Word and read Genesis. Like, get everything that I'm skipping over, all right? So the end of chapter 12, we see Abram and his wife Sarai. They end up going to Egypt because of a, a famine. He tells this lie to the Pharaoh, and they get in some trouble there. And then Genesis chapter 13, we find out that Abram and his nephew Lot, their, their, their families and their stuff get so big that they have to share, and they have, or not share, they have to split and separate. And then we, we see this, this promise repeated in Genesis chapter 13, verse 14. It says, after Lot had gone, the Lord said to Abram, Look as far as you can see in every direction, north and south, east and west. I'm giving all this land as far as you can see to you and your descendants as a permanent possession. I don't want to get into details today. I'm going to spend some time next week talking about the situation going on in Israel. But let this be real, kind of a, a really important verse in this whole conversation when God says to Abraham, who's going to have two sons, we're going to read about in a minute, one Ishmael, who's a, the father of the Arab people, and Isaac, who's the father of the Jewish nation, and he says that his promise is going to be filled through Isaac, and this land is going to be your descendants as a permanent possession. That ought to be an important part of that conversation. We'll talk about that next week. He goes on and says, I will give you so many descendants that like the dust of the earth, they cannot be counted. Go and walk through the land in every direction for I am giving it to you. So let me tell you the fourth thing that you need to do if you want to claim the promises made to Abraham. Number four, you need to expect the unexpected. Expect God to do unexpected things in your life. Don't be surprised when God does incredible things in your life. I mean, think about this for a moment. You've probably heard this illustration before if you attended this church for a little bit of time, but imagine I order a pizza and I want to share it with all of you today. Anyone hungry right now? I just mentioned, right, pizza. Imagine I, I'm kind of a cheapskate though, so I just order one and I count us all up and I slice it just so, so that everybody gets a piece. There's going to be a moment in the distribution of this pizza that you're frustrated there's other people here today. <laughs> because you're not going to get very much. You're going to get like a little crumb of pizza because there's so many of us. And the way our minds think in this world is we, it's called a zero-sum game type thinking where we assume there's a limited amount of resources and the more people there are, the, the less you get 
because we all have to share what limited resources we have. But the truth is our God is capable of going outside of, and I could put one large pizza on this stage and tell everybody to come get some, and then you all go back to your seats and you look down and you got a full large pizza on your lap. Right, we saw God do that with the fishes and the loaves. Right, God doesn't follow the rules of our logical thinking. He doesn't follow the zero-sum game. God can do anything he wants. He's, in fact, in, uh, I wrote it down in Ephesians. Where did I write this down? Sorry, I'm going out of order. Ephesians 3.20, it says, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. So I have some questions I want you to ask yourself. Think about this from Abraham's perspective first. Why would this promise that was made to Abraham, why would this be unexpected? If you read the text, what you're going to learn is that Abraham and his wife Sarai, they have a total of zero children. We already know that he's at least 75 years old at this moment. So what we know about this guy is he's 75 years old. We're about to learn his wife is like only 10 years younger than he is, right? And they have a total of zero children. So when God comes up to him and says, I'm going to make you the father of multitudes, so many that no one will be able to count all of your children. He's probably got to be scratching his head a little bit. Thinking this, if, if that really happened, that would be quite unexpected. How would that even work? In Genesis 15, God renews this promise, but we see how Abram is a little bit confused. And what he says in verse 15, verses 3 through 6, is you have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. And the Lord said to him, no, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will, be, who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, look up into the sky and count the stars. That's how many descendants you will have. Now, don't miss this last sentence. In fact, let's read it all together. You ready? This last sentence, read out loud. It says, and Abram believed the Lord. And the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. So what it says about Abram in this moment is in that, in that promise, he believed what God said to him. He believed that God was going to give him an a, a incredible number of descendants from his own blood, from his own body, that this was going to happen. It says that he believed it. It actually says that it was, he was counted as righteous I want to make sure you don't miss this. That's the exact same way that you and I are counted as righteous. The reason that you get counted in the category of righteous one day is because of your faith in Jesus. It's the same exact way Abram was counted as righteous because he had faith that God was going to do what he said he was going to do. And let me ask you that question. Do you believe, feel free to answer audibly, do you believe that God can do anything? I know some of you in here are thinking, well, he can't lie. But <laughs> Let me ask it another way. Maybe you'll answer with more confidence. Do you believe that God can do anything within his character? Yes. He can, right? And yet for some reason, we often make decisions and act in certain ways that, that kind of put that belief into question. But what I want us to learn is that we... We should expect the unexpected. In other words, we should not be surprised when God shows off. In fact, I would encourage you, don't be surprised when God shows off. When God does a miracle in your life, when God does something crazy unexpected, when God uh, provides something from a source you never expected, when God brings healing or someone comes out of the blue and, and seeks forgiveness and you're thinking, what in the world? This would have never happened. How about we go into our life knowing that we should expect God to do anything God wants to do, that we can expect the unexpected? Because clearly, children in Abraham's life were pretty unexpected at this moment. 
And here's where things get a little bit confusing. And I'm going to share with you one of the things that a lot of people wrestle with in Scripture. But before I do that, let me show you Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 2. And as I read this, I want you to ask this question. Did Abraham fully trust God or not? All right, it says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him. But she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abraham, or Abram, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarai's proposal. It doesn't say anything about it, but I hope, I like to think that Abram had a little bit of pushback in this conversation. I mean, it sounds like he was just like, sounds great. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. But when you read a passage like that, it's interesting to me because we just were told that, that Abram has faith, that he's believing that God's going to do what he says he can do. And then we have this, this account where it sounds like they're starting to question whether or not it's even possible. So how do these two things marry up? It sounds a little bit like doubt to me. It sounds like hesitation to me. It sounds like a lack of faith to me. Here's what Paul wrote. Paul wrote this in Romans 4 about Abraham in verse 20. He says, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. Paul says, never wavered. He goes on to say, in fact, his faith grew stronger and in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And then I read that passage, and I'm thinking, wait, never wavered? He went and slept with his wife's like, maid to, 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 to bring about this promise. Like, I, I, I feel like there's some wavering in there. So how do these two accounts reconcile? And I think what we have to understand is Abram never stopped believing that God was going to make him the father of many nations. That it was going to come from his body, his line. And what he did, the mistake he made, was thinking that God needed his help in bringing it about. That's where we often, we, we know that God's made a promise. We're like, God, I believe you. I know that you're going to do this. And boy, should you be thankful I'm here because I got a plan. This kind of happened in a different way in my life when, when God finally told us, Matt, I want you to go into ministry. This is now about nine years ago. Some of you have just, just learning. I've only been in ministry for about nine years. This was the first church we worked at as a pastor. And um, when God said, Matt, I want you to go into ministry now, I decided to help God out. And I was like, that's great. Uh, we're just going to look, though, in the 302 area code of North Delaware, because that's where you're going to use me, God. <laughs> just want you to know, like, I'm willing to go wherever you want, as long as it's here. You know, I'm willing to go anywhere. I'm willing to do anything you want, God, but, but I know you're capable of all things, so you're going to find a job for us here where we're comfortable. And what we do is we start trying to help God out. We try to push things along. We try to, to, to lack, in our lack of patience, we start, we start trying to get things done on God's behalf. And so while Abraham, he never actually doubted that God would do what he said he was going to do, he takes things into his own hands and he makes a big mess. Hagar gets pregnant. There's a bunch of jealousy and contempt between his wife and and Hagar, and then Ishmael is born, one of Abraham's sons that we're going to hear more about next week. And so this was not a part of God's plan and part of God's promise for Abraham. But as you're going to learn in life, God always takes the things that we do that aren't part of his perfect will, and he works them out as to be part of his ultimate will. He always knows what he's going to do, even with your mistakes. All right, here's a fifth thing. If you want to claim the promises that God made to Abraham, number five, you need to let God change you. You need to let God change you. And here, here's what I mean by that. 
We have a phrase that we use around this church often, and it sounds like this. God loves you the way you are. By the way, I want you to know that's 100% true. God loves you with the sin that you brought into this room, the struggle that you have that's a secret that nobody knows about right now, the, the, the problems that you got going on, the weaknesses in your life, all those things. I want you to know without a doubt, 100%, God loves you just the way you are. Now, where a lot of churches stop is right there. And people go on living in their sin thinking, well, God loves me. This is the way he made me. This is who I am. And I'm just going to live it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to be me. See, there's a second part to that statement. God loves you just the way you are right now, but he loves you way too much to leave you that way. He has a better plan for your life than you have for your life right now. He has something better for you on the other side of your sin. He has an incredible plan for your life, and he doesn't want you to stay the way you are. If you do stay the way you are, he still loves you. But he wants you to change. He wants you to become more like his son And we see this in the story of Abraham in that he comes to Abraham and he actually makes a pretty powerful change in Abram's life. It says in verse 17, or chapter 17, verse 1, it says, when Abram uh, Abram was 99 years old, by the way, he still doesn't have that son that was promised, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty, serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee you to give you countless descendants. At this, Abram fell face down on the ground. Then God said to him, this is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more, you ready for this? I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham. For you will be the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations. And kings will be among them. You know, in the Hebrew culture, first names are very important. In fact, a rabbi wrote, it's as if a spirit of prophecy rests upon the parents, giving them foresight into what name they should give their child that they will fulfill in the future. A name is a really powerful thing. And when God comes to Abram and says, hey, listen, Abram, your Abram name, it's not going to be your name anymore. Your new name is going to be Abraham. You see, the name Abram means father. Abraham means the father of multitudes. He actually changes Sarai's name too. He changes her name from Sarai, which means princess, to Sarah, which means the mother of nations. You see, God speaks into their life. He he attaches a name to them that matches the covenant and promise that he's made to them. He changes them. In Genesis 17, verse 8, he says, and I will give the entire land of Canaan where you now live as a foreigner to you and your descendants. It will be their possession forever and I will be their God. Isn't it amazing as you read through these passages how many times God renews this promise to Abraham over and over again? He says basically the same thing each time, doesn't he? Do you want to know why God does that? It's because Abraham is probably a lot like us. We're not the sharpest tool in the shed. Oftentimes we need people to say things multiple times to us so that we can remember the promise that God has made, we can hear that truth spoken over us multiple times. And so what happens next is God then reminds Abraham, who's now Abraham, not Abram, that he will have a son with Sarah, with his wife, and that they are to name him Isaac. And then it says that laughter is what results from this conversation. In Genesis 17, 17, it says, Then Abraham bowed down to the ground, but he laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I become a father at the age of 100, he thought. And how can Sarah have a baby when she is 90 years old? Remember, he's thinking, God, I know that you can do anything. I have total faith that you're going to fulfill the promise. 
but I just don't understand how it works when two people are beyond the age of childbearing, how in the world you're going to bring this to be. And it says that he laughs about it in himself, to himself. And then it also says in, uh, about the same thing, I think, in chapter 18 about Sarah. It says, Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time, and Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself and said, how could a worn out woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is so old? I love, she's sitting there at 90 saying, my husband's so old, right? How is this going to work? And says that she laughs silently to herself. Here's another question I want you to ask. Being honest with yourself. Have you ever laughed either audibly or maybe just inside your spirit at a plan that God had for your life? Has somebody ever spoken maybe some prophecy over you and said, I see that God has this something in store. I I believe that you're going to do great things. I believe this. I believe that. And you hear it and you think to yourself, ha, man, there's no way that would ever happen to me. There's no way I'm capable of that. There's no way anyone would ever ask me to do that. There's no way I could pull that off. Well, I want you to know you're in good company. Here's the sixth thing to wrap up our message today. How to claim the promises made to Abraham. Number six, don't stop believing. How many of you just took a a little road trip to the 80s with me? (laughs) Don't stop believing, right? Don't stop believing. God renews this promise to Abraham over and over again. And Abraham continues to believe and trust that God's going to do it. He's sitting there at 99 years old. And he's he's kind of laughing internally, like, how is this even possible? He doesn't quite get it, but he doesn't stop believing. And so God is gracious with their questions and continues to remind them of his promises. It says in Genesis 18, verse 14. I love this verse. If you got your Bible out and you got a pen out, underline this verse. It says, is anything too hard for the Lord? By the way, that's a definition of a rhetorical question right there. God already knows the answer to his question. Is anything too hard for the Lord, church? Nothing's too hard for the Lord. He says, I will return about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And for the sake of time, I'm going to skip past some chapters. There's some great parts of the story about Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt. And you need to go back and read all that. But I want to stay focused on Abraham for a moment. Genesis, uh, skipping forward to chapter 21. Check this out. It says, And the Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. Notice it doesn't say that he did kind of what he promised or he he had a workaround. No, it says he did exactly what he promised. She became pregnant and she gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened just at just the time God had said it would. And Abraham named their son Isaac. Don't miss this. 25 years had to go by from the time God promised this son the beginning part of this promise that he'd be a father of multitudes of nations. 25 years had to go by from that first promise when he is told to leave this land to when he actually has this son in his arms. Uh, A little fun fact about me, one of my favorite things to do with friends, and I don't do it often, maybe like once a quarter, I'll get around with some other guys, we'll sit around a table and we'll play a low stakes game of Texas Hold'em. Anyone else ever played Texas Hold'em before? Anyway, any played poker? Poker, all right. We'll put like $10 in the pot and someone's gonna walk away with 50 bucks or 80 bucks or something. It's fun and it's cheaper than going to a movie, right? So we'll, 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 we'll sit there and you, you, at some point you're holding cards in your hand. You have two cards that are yours. There's some cards on the table and you're trying to read everyone else. You're trying to figure out are the cards that I'm holding in my hand, do I think that they're more likely of winning that pot than everyone else's cards that are sitting at this table? 
Or do I think everyone else believes my cards are better than theirs, that I have a likely chance of winning everything in this pot, that I can bluff my way? And ultimately, right, at some point, you're so confident in what you're holding, you're so confident in what you have, that you're willing to do what? Go all in. Go all in. What all in means is you take all your chips and you push them in and you're saying, I'm willing to bet every last chip I have, every last little dime I have to stay in this game that I'm going to win. And if someone else is just as confident, they're going to go in too and it gets really exciting and all this, right? But here's the point. If we really believe that God can do everything, that God always keeps his promises, that whatever the promises he's made to Abraham have some effect on us today, then we got to understand, God, I want to, my my house, my money, my children, my wife, everything that I have— God, I'm willing to to do whatever it is that you want me to do because I recognize that you are the only one worthy of going all in for. You're the winning hand. I know I can't lose with God. And so I'm willing to go all in. And that's essentially the life of Abraham. We see this over and over again. He's willing to go all in. And then we see God change their laughter. Remember they had that laughter of doubt? He changed it from doubt to joy in Genesis 21, verse 6 and 7. It says, And Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter. All who hear about this will laugh with me. Who would have said to Abraham and Sarah, uh, said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse a baby? Yet I have given Abraham a son in his old age. There she is again. I think Sarah's one of the ones that, you know, is posting on Instagram every birthday that it's her 39th or 29th birthday. She's hanging on. So what do we do with this? By the way, I wish I could keep going into the life of Abraham. A couple chapters from now, you're going you're gonna to hear about how Abraham's faith is tested, whether or not he's willing to trust God with the life of his son. Keep reading all that. Keep reading all the way through the end of the book. In fact, don't stop at Genesis. Keep reading all the way through the end of this thing because this book is full of promises that apply to your life. But I I pulled out one more verse to challenge you with our what now, God. What would God have you to do with all this information? In Genesis chapter 18, verse 19, it says this about Abraham. It says, I have singled him out so that he will direct his sons and their families. Uh, Remember, if you've been paying attention, how many of you are part of Abraham's family? All right. I have singled him out so that he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Then I will do for Abraham all that I have promised. And so when we're talking about these promises made to Abraham, The challenge I want to make for you this morning to consider is which of these six things we talked about do you need to to work on? Which of these things do you need to do to claim the promises that were made to Abraham? Do you need to accept Jesus Christ as Lord today? Is that the thing that you need to do first? Do you need to do something hard that God has asked you to do that you don't want to do? Is God asking you to be patient about something good he wants to do in your life. He just doesn't want to do it yet. Is he asking you to expect the unexpected and to open up your hands ready to receive more than you can even think or imagine? Maybe he's asking you to let God change you. Maybe you're sitting here, you know that God loves you the way you are, but you haven't been willing to let God put a new name over you and to speak a new truth into your life. Or maybe that sixth one, maybe you're doubting And you just need to be reminded today not to stop believing. I don't know which one, but maybe it's two or three or four, six of them. Would you write that down on your what now God section of your notes and just give that over to God and start walking with him in that way. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for the way you work in our lives. We thank you for this journey that we've been able to go on where we get to learn more about where all things started, that you, you created time and space and matter for us. And then we entered into that. And instead of doing things your way, because of your love, you allowed us to choose to do things our way if we wanted to. And we chose sin. 
And now we have this constant struggle and this, this journey that we're trying to get on to be reconciled back to you. God, we learned about oh, why there's different people in this room that look differently than each other and talk differently than each other as, as you've created this incredible diversity amongst your people. And then we got to study the story of Abraham and how his faithfulness and his, the promises that were made to him still affect the church today and the way that you're still working in our lives today. Father, would you allow us to glean from this truth, whatever it is you want us to do, so we can look more like your son. We love you. We thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.